you know, one of the problems that I see a lot of people do, as I said to a good friend of mine, I want you to be in love with your wife, Jennifer, not one asset class. So don't get overly complacent. That's one of the concerns I have where everything seems to be going up. This could be a replay of 2000, by the way, what we're going through right now, everything's going up. At some point, there's going to be a uh, retraction. Uh, you know, there's, uh, this, this bubble is going, these bubbles are going to burst. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we study bubbles, what we find is on average, the decline is 80% uh, from peak to trough. And we've seen several examples of that. So uh, as I say to folks is prepare for the worst, but uh, if it is the case that more Americans became millionaires during depression one, let's act as if it's depression two, <clears throat> let's be prepared for it. Let's not just hope it doesn't happen. And let's recognize the best way I can put it is uh, depression or recession is kind of like winter. Things die in the winter, but some things get healthier during the winter. And maybe the best thing to keep in mind is, uh, I don't think this is gonna change. Mm -hmm. Spring always follows winter. Thanks for watching this RTD interview. Don't forget to pick up your RTD Scary George Round, only available at stboyer.com. Now enjoy this interview. Welcome to his RTD interview. Today I'm excited to have Mr. John Grace. He's the founder and president of Investors Advantage Corporation, and today he's joining us on RTD to share his thoughts on the monetary system, financial matters, as well as a variety of other subject matter. So John Grace, welcome to RTD interviews. Good to be with you, Mike. Well, I appreciate you taking time uh, to sit out with me. Sorry about the hiccups on, on connecting this afternoon, but I'm excited to get, have a chance to connect with you and to get your thoughts on a variety of subject matter. So you're into, in the re retirement planning and investment strategizing uh, industry. So I'm looking forward to finding out more about how you help out your clients. And so before we dive further, can you give us a little bit of your background and how you've arrived at this point in your career? Sure. Well, in fact, it's kind of funny because I was at a at a temple a couple of weeks ago for a funeral of a, of a client. And when I pulled up to the temple, I said, oh my goodness, this looks so familiar. Turns out it was the temple where I was best man in a Jewish wedding. And the groom's father is the one who said, you know what, I wanna to talk to him. He might do well on the independent side of being in the financial planning business. That was like 1977. Mm -hmm. So it was like just a flood of memories, you know, that just come crashing through. Uh, you know, you're there, you know, to uh, observe, to respect someone who's just passed away, a rocket scientist, really good guy. But then, to, yeah, to see all these, these, these memories come flooding in, uh, you know, up front and in person from all the memories of being best man at a Jewish wedding. So I, I like to say, Mike, that sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be that person. And then the groom's father saw, thought that I might be a good person to be in the industry. The rest is history. And, and you'll like this. Turns out that uh, I called the groom uh, leaving the temple. And he tells me that as a, partly as a result of my conversation with his son, now 26, uh, who's in Boston, he's entering the financial services industry. So it, it's, it's a beautiful thing when, when it comes full circle like that. All right. Sounds good. So I appreciate you for sharing that. And so I'm curious to get your take on a variety of subject matter. And so you're in the financial investing sector. And so uh, at this current moment, there's a lot of problems going on. Uh, we have, you know, the pension issues. We have underfunded. Uh, we're not underfunded, but lack of funding for people's retirements in general, the millennial generation and all of those things we're going to get to. You know, what are some things that concerns you right now that you perhaps deal with with your clients or just things that concern you in general? Well, there certainly would be a number of things. First and foremost, I would say that when people get around to investing, and that's typically the way it goes, uh, it's not by a plan, it's by uh, just circumstance. And typically, it's, it's when people reach their 40s that they're going, geez, we better do something. Uh, so the first thing that I'm always, in, I think is always important, and by the way, our trademark is the proof is in the planning, is to do the plan. I mean, most of us Americans spend more time planning our weddings and our vacations than we do for our financial future. So what I want to see, and that's what we do, is help people take the time to plan to say, all right, Mike, at what age do you want to make work optional? In today's dollars, how many dollars is that now? Would you like to replicate that in, let's say, 35 years? I mean, you might be 30, so let's say 35 years. Uh, and then at 65, you know, to have the equivalent of the income, what does your target need to be? And in many cases, it takes about 30 minutes. And so many people, you know, we don't do well with math. 
Uh, we don't really, really want to think. We just want to buy everything in sight. That's the American way. And then with people with a lot of time, the target becomes two, three, four million dollars. Mm-hmm. That's not going to get any easier. But if you can't see the target, how the heck might you hit it? Yeah. So we want people to see that target. That, that's first and foremost. And then for people who have assets, now the question becomes, how much loss can you manage? You know, probably the only thing that my industry, been at it for 40 years now, has, has, has messaged successfully is buy and hold, sit and take, take, sit and take it, hold and hope. And what I'm saying is if you're in your 30s and you don't need the money right now and you can keep adding to your account, that's a great time not to care what the market does. But let's suppose it's your grandfather who's in his 70s now and has to take re- required minimum distributions from his traditional retirement account. Now he can't accept a 50% loss again when he's taking out three or 4%. So the whole notion of buy and hold works when you don't need the money. It works when you're adding to the account. It works if you don't care what this account does. But when you start taking withdrawals, now it's a whole new ball of wax. And that means that we should be looking at how we can limit the losses in a bad year like 2008 so we don't have to go down effectively like the Titanic. Sounds good. Now, you mentioned planning and, and basically just beginning to plan, having an idea and having a target. And so a lot of the things that concerns me being a little bit on the younger side is that having witnessed some of the um, side effects of monetary right. policy on, yeah. on how planning can go, you can have a, you can have a great plan. But yet outside of your initial plan, now we have, I believe, external forces, which is, happens to be with the central banking model and, and debt issuance of our government and things of that nature that really concerns me. Now, when it comes to setting a target as far as what you would like to do outside of what's going on around you, how much of, uh, say, monetary policy with you know, this uh, repo activity, quantitative easing, does right. that, can that play into like, hindering some plans perhaps? It could, but I'm going to say don't let that be your hurdle. It's a good excuse, frankly, to say, well, you know, things are, it's so unsettling. There's so much uncertainty. I'm just going to do nothing. No, you have, look, we were working with a young man. Um, we, we have uh, three generations. It says three, you know, family members. He just finished college in Nashville, or he just went home to Nashville. He's 24. He hopes to get a job at $60,000 a year. His debt level is uh, $240,000 just for school, okay? Uh, but here's the thing. If he were to focus on that and look at all the hurdles, he'll never recognize, for him, I believe his goal is $3.4 million. And to get from 24 to, I believe his age was 70 uh, successfully, it means setting aside $400 a month. Now, you know, he doesn't have a job yet, but let's just recognize if he waits until he's 40, that number could easily triple. So if you think 400 was difficult, try 1200. In fact, we had sat with one client and said, geez, we got bad news for you. You need to save 80% of what you're earning just to catch up. Because right now, when you get to be 65 or 70, the only money you have is a very modest pension and some social security. But you guys, you and your husband are making really good money and you don't have anything set aside to replicate this good money. So, so embark on the plan. And by the way, it's kind of like, you know, I've driven across the country a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's funny what you encounter that wasn't part of your plans. And it becomes part of the satisfaction in telling the story about who you met or what you ate or where you drank something, you know, where the locals showed you around. So em- embark on the plan. As I say, it's not going to get any easier. And, and America loves to spin, baby spin. So how are you going to be ready for life after your last paycheck? That's where you should focus. Yeah, that's understandable. So I, I definitely agree about an importance of having a plan and, and beginning somewhere. And so, like for me personally, you know, being a a person who finished college around the last crisis time frame, and I was a victim of having lost uh, some of my early starting funds in with uh, when Bear Stearns went under. And so it got me to rethinking everything that I'm currently experiencing now. My prior background happens to be in sports, and so I had a chance of traveled and living in the different countries, and I still stay in contact with a lot of uh, people that I've met in such in areas such as Argentina and, and as well as Venezuela, and and so looking at how monetary policy has impacted them, you know, their plans were altered due to the fact that their currencies are not really worth much these days. Right. As a part of my thoughts. Moving forward, you know, I don't have much confidence in the Federal Reserve note or the Federal Reserve system the way that it's set up now to where I really feel comfortable or don't feel as comfortable setting aside just solely 
currency units and, and financial instruments and hoping that they'll be there 30 years for me, my, for me personally. So, so how would you help someone overcome those concerns about the very currency itself? Well, first I would remind you, particularly when it comes to Argentina, they do have a great pension plan mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem to be changing in spite of all the drama that you've seen in that country. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's, I've been there a couple of times, so I'm, I'm, I have some familiarity with that. But as I say, it, the job is your job to do. And um, what I would submit is, in fact, this is a conversation I have with people who are, we had one couple, they brought in their, their granddaughter and I said, okay, look, pretend your grandparents aren't in the room. I'm just talking to you because the conversation I'm having with them is different than the conversation I'm about to have with you. They won't accept what I'm going to say to you, but you're, you're, you just graduated college. So you've got time on your side. So if you're putting in a hundred bucks and maybe you don't want to, but you're doing it. And you know, the, your share price for whatever it is you buy is 10 bucks a share. You buy 10 shares, right? So now let's suppose your scenario is, but a month later, now the share drops 50%. So instead of being $10 a share, it's $5 a share. Some people would say, oh my goodness, it went down. I shouldn't invest. But let's see if you did with the same $100, how many shares do you now buy? Would that be 20? So you tell me what's wrong with getting twice as many shares as you did a month ago mm -hmm. with the same investment. So yeah, let's yeah. just recognize when you go to the beach, you collect the shells when the tide is out, right? So when prices are down, when you have uh, you know, things that have declined, and by the way, putting it in perspective, De Great Depression won on a per capita basis. More Americans became millionaires than any other time in history. Mm -hmm. Really? Well, that's the worst economic time we've ever seen. That's correct. But notice cash is king, mm -hmm. and businesses, and how homes, and um, stocks all came down dramatically in about a 30-month period. So those with cash, not equity, big distinction, don't confuse the two, cash is king, what do they say about equity? Crickets. So those who had cash and those who were able to move into those spaces when prices are depressed, were able to ride the next wave. No different than if you're investing in 2008, yes, uh, tech stocks got, got, got uh, crushed, but let's also recognize most of us where we got crushed did not appreciate the risk we were taking. We did not diversify. We thought we knew the stock that we were investing in, and you don't know that the next stock, what, what company is going to become an Enron. So you know, one of the problems that I see a lot of people do, as I said to a good friend of mine, I want you to be in love with your wife, Jennifer, not one asset class. So don't get overly complacent. That's one of the concerns I have, where everything seems to be going up. This could be a replay of 2000, by the way, what we're going through right now. Everything's going up. At some point, there's going to be a uh, retraction. Uh, you know, there's, uh, this, this bubble is going, these bubbles are going to burst. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we study bubbles, what we find is on average, the decline is 80% uh, from peak to trough. And we've seen several examples of that. So uh, as I say to folks is prepare for the worst. But uh, if it is the case that more Americans became millionaires during Depression One, let's act as if it's Depression Two. <clears throat> let's be prepared for it. Let's not just hope it doesn't happen. And let's recognize the best way I can put it is uh, uh, depression or recession is kind of like winter. Hmm. Yeah. Be pretty severe in Michigan. <laughs> pretty yeah. severe yeah. in New York and Minnesota. <laughs> not so bad in California, right? Yeah. But uh, things die in the winter. But some things get healthier during the winter. And maybe the best thing to keep in mind is, uh, I don't think this is going to change. Mm -hmm. Spring always follows winter. Yeah. So uh, work through the winter and, uh, you know, get your, get your shells and put them in your cheeks and store them away. And then spring will follow. And that's why it's, it's a whole new ball game with, with the light, as I say, uh, enjoying the upside. Yeah. Now, one thing you mentioned is just the risk there. And so I, I look at it as like, okay, the risk reward. And so me wow. looking at everything now, as you mentioned, the bubbles, everything is overly inflated and the price valuations for equities to me uh, are, are somewhat uh, artificial in nature due to this 10 year expansion, the longest bull run and whatnot since the last crisis. And so I just naturally anticipate that this next correction might actually be a little bit prolonged as well because we have you know corporate debt at all-time highs negative yielding bonds all around the world and and I, I I'm of the mindset that this next event or occurrence or whatever's occurring or going to come won't just be isolated 
and it won't be just a United States issue. I, I see it more being of a global nature. And as a response to that, I see central banks becoming more, um, uh, more involved in a, in a very unhelpful way for those that follow the conventional methods when it comes to just saving. Because I believe like with the Euro and the Chinese Yuan, you know, eventually the currencies, and that's one big, big thing that I go back to is that, you know, it's good to prepare and to plan, but yet is there such thing as like your plans or preparation not necessarily working out the way that you want to because of the impacts of this next recessionary, which might be depressionary as you even hinted at yourself? Yeah, but let's make sure we keep in mind there's always a bull market somewhere. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah. So if we exclude ourselves by saying, Jesus, all going to burst and I'm just not going to play, I'm going to say, well, what did you learn and how, how did you take advantage? Yeah. How were you prepared? I suspect the answer is no, because maybe you're sitting in cash. And, and let's keep in mind, when we look at 08 and, you know, if another um, event happens like 08, notice that the, uh, the, the, currency, the, the, the currency of choice was the U.S. dollar. That's not changing. And please recognize that everything is traded in, guess what, the U.S. dollar, and oil is traded in, guess what, the U.S. dollar. If that's not an advantage uh, to the U.S. consumer, I don't know what is. Yeah. And, and to your point about the debt, let's recognize the consumer's playing the same game, too. The debt level for consumers today is higher than it's ever been. Uh, we were about $13 trillion in 2008. We dipped down to about $12 trillion about 2012. Now we're about $14 to $15 trillion, depending on your source. So a lot of folks, and, and, and it's not, I'm not trying to beat people up. What I'm saying is that so many of us, um, we have jobs that aren't paying what they were paying 10 years ago. So what we're trying to do is put some uh, duct tape on the situation and uh, acquire more debt to live like we used to live. But at some point, this uh, the the carousel does stop. The music comes to an end, and everybody's got to get off. And it, it, I think it will be ugly, and I think it will uh, involve uh, the world in, in the next debacle. That that I, I don't know how we're going to miss it. Thanks for watching this interview. If you're enjoying content like this, feel free to become a part of the RTD community by becoming a member via Patreon. All it takes is a monthly contribution of about $5 a month for more great content such as this. Just scroll down beneath this video here and click the Patreon link and then hit this tab right here to become a member of the team. Looking forward to bringing you more great content. Now, let's get back to this interview. Thanks. Yeah. Now, okay, a part of that is that, you know, just, you know, I, I'm not a doom and gloom guy. You know, I'm actually, I, I kind of call myself a realist, just looking at things from a global macro standpoint and saying that, you know, we're in big, we, we were in big trouble. It's just because, you know, it, it looks like, you know, on a political front here in the U.S., there's division, left, right, everyone hates the current administration. You know, so it's one of the things where just seeing and watching as a younger person, seeing our country, the United States of America, mm -hmm. At such uh, at odds with the world itself, like we we become enemies of so many different countries, and so it's just one of those things where I like to look at things from more of a skeptical standpoint, and so that's why I'm I'm I'm, I'm hitting at these topics the way that I am, and so a lot of the viewers for this channel happen to be uh, precious metals enthusiasts, and so when it comes to preservation of wealth for the long term, that's kind of where I'm hinting, hinting at where not really relying upon financial products because there's a variety of amount out there and more to come, I believe. But yet when it comes to gold and silver, like they've outperformed currencies in various parts of the world for the last decade plus. And then China has plans with gold and silver. And all. so there's a lot of activity in that sector there. What are your thoughts on that? Is that something that you consider as a, a hedge against possible risk when it comes to all this debt and the things that might be coming down the line? Well, let me give you my best example. Uh, what I'm saying again is don't be complacent. And what I find is so, talking with one client, 19 houses. I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. Another client, uh, six houses. Mm -hmm. And they don't like any of them, <laughs> including the one they live in. And he's another rocket scientist. Uh -huh. And I'm like, sell them all and go buy the one you want to enjoy. Why are you doing toilets, uh, you know, tenants and trash? over and over again. Every time I talk to you, I hear these stories about the window got busted and you had to go replace the pipes, you had to replace the hot water heater. Why are you doing this? This is lunacy, mm -hmm. but you, you, you can't get off that track because it's the treadmill that you've been running on for so long. Everybody in your family is on both sides. They're doing the same thing. So I'm always gonna be cautious. And, and let me give you maybe my best example. Uh, again, this is not a template, but to me, success leaves clues. And if we look at the Yale Endowment, Yale University Endowment. 
So play along with me, please. You may have looked. Most people haven't, but it's really kind of surprising. Uh, first and foremost, it's like $29.4 billion. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's a big fund, okay? Let's suppose you're, you're sitting on their board, and yeah. you're looking at your last statement, which they only make public, I believe, June 30. And by the way, it usually comes out around September. So they're pretty clever about uh, uh, doing what they're doing, but not necessarily showing immediately what they're up to. So what do you imagine as a percentage, and you, you'll never get this right, so don't, don't struggle with it. I didn't get it right, so I say don't struggle with it. What do you imagine Yale with 29.4 billion has as a percentage in U.S. stocks? Um, I would imagine, based upon my little bit of information, they, they are, they're probably overly, overly involved in, in equities markets right now because they're on, a, on the upside. So probably more than, it's probably healthy for them, perhaps. Okay. And so the last time I looked, I believe the answer was 3%. Really? Uh-huh. Interesting. Okay. Yes. So complete it off there. Go ahead. All right. So we only got two more to go. Yeah. Uh, next one would be, would be corporate bonds as a percentage, 29.4 billion. What do you imagine Yale has in corporate bonds? Well, since you just threw out 3%, I would probably say, uh, let's go you know, 5%. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go low. I'll go low. Right. No, that's, that's where we're going. So, so you're, you're, you're close. It's four. All right. Okay. But let's just notice, let's just stop there for a minute. Mm -hmm. Typically, my industry has told you, your parents, your grandparents, you need to be diversified. And diversification is uh, uh, d described by having 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Mm -hmm. Notice they are not even close to either one of those. Okay. Yeah. I find that interesting. So then the next position is internationals. I'll give you this one. It's 15. So four plus, uh, you know, what do we have? Uh, three plus four is seven plus 15, 22. So we've got 22, 24% in the traditional assets. Vastly mm -hmm. different than what my industry has told you to have 100% of their assets. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So only 24% in, in internationals, uh, cash, and uh, stocks. So what, that, what, what the next surprise, aha, for me is I count eight asset classes. Mm. Eight. Okay. And I notice that their largest bet is about 17.6%. There are no big bets. Mm. So what I'm trying to say by example is, so many of us have an opinion and we want the things to unfold the way we believe they're going to unfold, but what if they don't? Mm. Good point. If we're in eight asset classes, we and our largest percentage is less than 20%, no big bets, we don't have to be right. <laughs> Good point. Okay. So I see currencies, I see commodities, I see business development corporations, I see a real estate investment trust, I see venture capital, I see private equity. Those are five or six asset classes that most of us aren't even aware exist. Yeah. <laughs> so Yale's doing vastly different than most of us as individual investors, or even by working on the retail side with the securities, exchange, securities industry is saying it, it's it, you're diversified with two asset classes, 60% stocks and 40% bonds. So I, I think you see what I'm saying. Yeah. I, we're going to suggest that we err on the side of being conservative because you don't know what's going to surprise you to the downside, just as you don't know what's going to surprise you to the upside. But if we have six, seven, eight asset classes, as much as our money can take us in terms of being diversified, We'll probably miss the, the highs, but more importantly, we'll miss some of those lows that you're very concerned about. Mm, that sounds good. Now, I'm curious, you know, because you, you gave an example earlier of one of your clients, that a younger guy, and so he gave you a target number of what he would like to be able to retire with based upon today's dollars. Yes. And so one of the issues, and once again, not doom and gloom, but just, you know, inflation. Um, you know, Federal Reserve can't seem to get 2%. I can point out several things as well beyond 2%. So just trying to actually come up with a number uh, that would be ideal? Like what are some ideas or some solutions or positions that you can help people uh, park their funds in that could counter the impacts of inflation 20, 30 years from now, regardless of the currency situation that might be there or not? Yeah, we're going to suggest that portfolios perform at the speed of about 5, 6, 7% overall net after expenses. Mm -hmm. So we want folks to see where that evidence is. We also want them to see how bad whatever we're putting them in uh, turned out in 2008. Our clients, for example, were off uh, maybe 20% when the market was off 37%. We can talk about how that was accomplished. It wasn't magic. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a magic wand either. 
but we want to limit the losses for those where that's important. Some people, it's not important. For a lot of people, it's absolutely important, and, and I couldn't agree more. Let's limit the losses so that you can stay in the game as opposed to needing a Hail Mary pass just to get back in the game. Yeah. So we're going to say, yeah, maybe 5 6 7% is a return, 400 bucks. Do that for, in this case, 24 through 70. That's what, uh, 50, 47, 48 years. Okay, that, and then you inspect annually. How am I doing? I mean, let's just notice, had we been in just U.S. equities last year, lo and behold, what do we have? Over 20%? I mean, it was hard not to get 20% anywhere in 2019. It was a spectacular year. Nobody expected that. But if we're expecting six or seven, and one year we have something north of 20, that builds a nice little cushion so that if there's a downturn in the future, well, we have more money than we would have had if we were getting six or seven compared to last year getting north of twenty uh, percent. Almost, uh, almost, it was hard to miss that one. Mm, interesting. Nice. Interesting. So, I'm curious as we get ready to wind down. Uh, I'm curious to find out, you know, when it comes to just the 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 role of, as I mentioned, a heavy audience here, in the, uh, precious metal enthusiasts. You know, what is your thoughts on the the commodity or gold and silver? I've always referred to them from a historical standpoint as being. Uh, you know, actual money in of itself, even though they're not positioned that way now, they're labeled commodities. But what are your thoughts on uh, ownership of precious metals? Is, is that something that you would recommend or tell people it's, you know, it's, it's good to do or not to do? Or what are your thoughts on that? We don't do much in that space. Uh, it's not a space that, uh, that, I, that I like a lot. Um, we do like the futures uh, with currencies and commodities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see, for example, in 2008, uh, those positions did really well to the upside uh, in a bad year, 2008. That that helps out a lot. Uh, but you know the problem is is that looking at uh, the returns and having the uh, ability to sell, it's something you have to do manually. What what we prefer to do, whether it's currencies, commodities, cash, or stocks or bonds, is to have each one liquid and then actively manage, which means you don't just buy it and hold it and pray that it goes up and then I can go to heaven. Mm -hmm. We are actively managing uh, the risk and the reward from the standpoint of looking at our clients' accounts daily, every single day. And the question is, is it risk on or risk off? My best way to put it is, remember the movie Karate Kid, uh, wax on, wax off, <laughs> okay? So in 2008, for the most part, you wanted to wax off. You wanted out of risk assets. You wanted to be in cash. Mm -hmm maybe alternatives, but you wanted to be in things where your loss, as I mentioned, was maybe 19.87, that's a real number in 2008, as opposed to 37% is what the markets did, real estate was off 34%, uh, currencies, commodities held up much better than the two at that time, but we didn't know that at the beginning of the year, so that's why I'm saying we want to be more diversified, so somewhere there's going to be uh, you know, capture to the upside. So the real, as I say, with uh, the our analogy of risk on, risk off, or wax on, wax off, out of risk assets 08 into cash, just to make it simple, mm -hmm. say it's 100% invested, 60, 40 stocks, bonds, doesn't matter, 80% stocks, 20% bonds. By year in 2008, it was primarily 60 to 100% cash. Mm -hmm. And then starting March 9th, when President Obama said, now may, may be a good time to invest in the stock market, that was the low, mm. uh, that would be the time to put the pedal to the metal and get out of risk assets and put it all on the table, and, you know, out of cash, out of safe assets, and then put it in risk assets 100% to enjoy, you know, the, the math is if we were off 20 and 08, and we got 25% net or more in 09, you have more money, 12, 31, 09, than you did 1, 108. And the traditional uh, ETFs and mutual funds probably took four to five years to get back to even as opposed to about 24 months. So by limiting those losses, again, the question that we want the folks where we're saying, please manage our clients' money, but look at it daily. Are you putting coal on this fire or are you putting water on this fire? That's the question we want asked every day so nobody wakes up and go, oh, no, it happened again. Mm, good points. Interesting. Now, as we get ready to go draw to the end, the pension um, situation underway. And so uh, there, there's a lot of people out there talking about uh, just the fact that underfunded, a lot of the states. And so the, the, the CalPERS, California situation is very interesting. Uh, I think New Jersey is interesting. Illinois is interesting. So there's a lot of states that are heavily, severely underfunded. And so what, what the governments are t attempting to do is to increase taxes on the younger or just the younger generation in general. So they're kicking a can down the road. Uh, what, yeah. what are your 
thoughts on how this pension situation might play out? Yeah, I, I would say uh, be cautious with your expectations mm. because, uh, you know, this is a real scenario where a friend of mine's dad uh, retired from one of the airlines and had a very nice pension at $10,000 a month. And then, I don't know, 10, 15 years later, uh, he got a nice little letter saying your pension benefit is going to be reduced to 1200 bucks. Mm. Imagine waking up to that reality. So what I'm saying, again, in terms of the complacency, you know, don't just think this pension is the cat's meow. You need to have your own money. You don't know what they're doing with this money. You don't know how the board's going to change 10, 15 years from now. You have no idea how the structure might change. Or they find as many pensions, to your point, have uh, our discovery, all of their expectations was 7 8% as a return, but the reality is they've invested about 4 or 5%. Clearly, we have, we have some space there, and you're only going to make it up by either reducing benefits or um, you know, uh, reducing the payout to the pensioners and making the younger people pay more in. But that's what I'm saying. This, that, that is completely out of their control. It's a nice benefit to the extent that it does what it's supposed to do, but no one can foresee how that might change. So we come back to, it, it's all on you, baby, okay? Uh, it's 100% your job to make sure you have enough money. Treat Social Security and the pension as icing on the cake. Let's bake a very fine cake. Yeah, good point. Well, John Grace, it's been great having you here on RTD. I enjoy being able to go back and forth, get your thoughts and, and uh, analysis on what's going on and how preparation is key. And so it, it falls back on you to make sure that you're doing what you need to do to uh, protect yourself and to prepare for your own future. So I appreciate you for sharing that. Can you point people back to uh, you as to where they can find out more about, you know, what you have all to offer as well as be a blessing to your work? Sure, sure. Appreciate it, Mike. Uh, yeah, our website is easier than it might sound. It's ybpoor.com. That's W-H-Y-B-E-P-O-O-R.com. And one of the things that folks can do with our site, Mike, is they can go through uh, like five or six questions to find out for themselves what kind of risk of loss they can accept. Mm -hmm. So when we sit with folks and they answer the questions, because, you know, the problem, again, with my industry I, I can I'm, I can do this because I've only been at it for 40 years, so I qualify. Uh, but we ask you, are you conservative, moderate, or aggressive? None of us understand what those terms mean. Mm -hmm. So why are we using uh, Mandarin Chinese? Because we don't get it. So <laughs> instead of going there, what we want you to do is find out, probably for the first time, what kind of loss is acceptable to you? In this one example, these are folks who in Hawaii, and they ran through the questions, and they said, oh, geez, we can live with an 8% loss. We're getting ready to retire. You know, it was, it, I don't know what, no, what they said, I don't know what it did last, in 2008, and, uh, but I, we're sure we don't want it to go through that again. So then that's the first thing, 8%. Then we say, okay, let's take your portfolio, and let's run it backwards, assuming that all the positions that you hold, 12, 31, 19, were the same on 1, 108. Oh my goodness, look at 08. That's when the market was off 37%. I know you don't remember this, but here's the evidence. Your um, inexpensive funds were off 42%. Mm -hmm. hmm. Sometimes you get what you pay for. They say, oh my goodness, well, we can't afford to go through that again because now we're going to have to start taking withdrawals. I go, well, great. We're on the same page here, but it's your aha moment and I get to watch you. Uh, so then we create another portfolio, do the same thing, run it backwards. You know, So it's apples to apples as best we can. And we find that in the uh, recommended portfolio, they were off 7%. Ah, that's good. We can live with eight. This one didn't get there. So that's better for us. And we're long ways off of that 42%. Uh, because as I say, if you're taking withdrawals and there's a market turndown of 40, 50%, your chances of survival have just been, well, maybe crushed. Yeah. Wow. All right. So that's something that uh, sounds like a val valuable tool for people to use to kind of assess what their risk uh, to reward factor is and everything in between. So uh, thanks for sharing that information. So definitely I'll, I'll put the link to the to the ch uh, your channel or to your, your website in the video description. So once again, John Grace, it's been great having you here on RTD. Looking forward to continue to follow your work and to assess my risk as well with that uh, chart there and uh, go from there. I've enjoyed being on the show. Look forward to next time. Well, thank you. All right, Mike. Take care.